Hey, it's Jeremy from OpticHouse.com. So this video is something that I just thought would be useful to people because I'm at the beginning stages of a painting that I'm working on. And this relates to two things that I've done videos about recently. I did one that a lot of people responded to about improving without beating yourself up. Because a lot of times artists are hard on themselves and just say, you know, what I'm making isn't good, it's not good enough, I don't like it, it sucks. Um, and I had some thoughts on how we can take those negative thoughts and turn them into something being positive and productive. Another thing that I'd done a video on recently was about figure drawings that I throw away. I do a lot of figure drawings because I go to a, a class once a week and, you know, study from from live models in various poses and out of the ones I do even though I post a metric ton of them online on my blog there's still a lot that I don't post or there's ones that I post but I don't keep and throw away and then the ones that I do keep are ones that either teach me something specifically or they're ones that I'm going to use for something else like I'm going to paint on top of them anyway the way those two things relate is what this video is about and it's about how to give yourself constructive criticism. This is no, by no means the be all end all on the topic. This is a starting point to discuss and to think about ways you can apply this to your own work. And the idea is about how you take the things in your artwork that aren't working and are negative and you look at it and actually say, well, don't just be pissed at yourself that it's not good enough. How can you make it better? So I'm gonna show you in a piece that I'm working on right now. These are some initial sketches for a painting that I'm starting to work on. And the, the premise is that it's a woman who was, she started out kneeling in front of a giant dragon, then kind of morphed into her meditating in front of a dragon. And in the initial sketches, I knew that for me, the woman was gonna be in the forefront but I also wanted to have a sense of this dragon, the scale, having it being much larger than her. So I had some sketches that weren't even the composition of the piece yet. Some of these are just little thumbnails trying to figure out how big I want her to be in comparison to the dragon. Um, working out whether it was going to be the dragon sort of curling around her and her just in a tiny form. But in order to get the real majestic sense that I wanted, I thought it would be kind of cool to have the dragon kind of in front of her, wings furled out, looking dramatically. And so from there, I just went into experimenting with a bunch of different sketches, trying to figure out really the composition that I wanted. Was she going to be, you know, standing, kneeling? What pose was the dragon going to be in? Um, this one was interesting because that I started getting really interested in the head of the dragon, what the shape was going to be. And I started going through doing a lot more thumbnails, just trying to work out the dragon's head. Um, some of these are influenced by the album cover of by Mastodon, the, the album The Hunter. The, I forget the name of the artist, but there's a guy who makes these amazing woodcuts. And I'm sure if someone, if you know the guy's name, post it on the comments. I did know his name at one point because I looked it up, but I don't remember. Um, but he has these amazing woodcuts that look like vector illustrations, but they're actually physical sculptures of wooden blocks that he paints. So the structure of the dragon's face had a very blocky, you know, shape to it. And I was kind of playing with ideas of having a third eye kind of either embedded in his actual body or just kind of behind him. So these are all part of the iterative process of me working out what I want the piece to look like, the final thing. And by the time I had these heads, and I kind of combined them with, with this sketch, I came up with this one, which felt like this was what was gonna be my final composition. And I had her, instead of sitting on rocks, she sort of perched on the tail of the dragon as it kind of winds around through the pose. And this sketch, I actually scanned in, took it into Photoshop and did a quick uh, digital paint over it, just to work out the, the values and the color scheme for it. So, even that painting, it wasn't a particularly detailed painting. It was quick just to work out the, the color scheme that I wanted. This is what I kind of figured the piece was going to be. And this cross along here is not just, normally if I'm doing an illustration, I will do a cross piece because it kind of helps me think about how the elements are posed in the composition. In this case, this is more important because 
this painting is going to be done across four large canvases. So it's going to be like a painting that's going to take up a big wall. And because of that, I needed to know what elements were going to be on which canvas. Because I wanted to make sure that nothing important, like I, you know, this face is a little bit too close to the, the dragon's mouth is too close to the edge of this canvas. And these seams right here, I didn't want there to be tangents that were specifically touching the boundaries of each canvas. I want to make sure like it's okay to have the female figure to have her body cross from one canvas to the other, but I didn't want to have it where like the bottom of her thigh or her butt is on the base of the canvas or say that her head, her hair is just coming to an end right here. I either want to have her hair completely going all the way off of the canvas or a little bit in. Um, various things like that. So that was the part of the purpose of this cross here, is to figure out how I'm going to do this composition. This is what I thought was going to be the final piece, and I was fairly happy with it at the time I did it, which was several months ago. It's been a long time that I've been trying to get down to work on this painting, and I finally said, if I don't start now, I'm just there's always going to be other projects for me to work on. So I start priming my canvas and getting ready. And as I was getting ready to begin, I was looking at this piece one more time, and that's when that nagging that we all have starts coming at us. When you have a sketch and you look at it, the longer you look at it, the more you start seeing flaws in it and saying, mm, it's not quite there, I'm not quite happy with it. This is where you start being productive. This is where you don't, you, you turn off just saying, oh, this sucks or it's not good. And you say, all right, what is it I don't like about this piece? And I can tell you right now, even though I was trying to go for the idea of having the dragon being a little bit in the distance and having his head being large and then having her sort of in the foreground, you don't get a sense of scale. You get a sense of the dragon being lifted up you know, in front of her and that she is definitely smaller than the dragon, but you don't get a sense that like this is a big massive creature and she's this little tiny human. You get a sense that it's a big massive creature and she's sitting on its back, but it's like maybe three times the size of a horse. You don't get a sense of depth and scale. So I said, all right, first things first, I really need to change this composition if I really want to have a sense of scale. And as much as I wanted the female figure to be large, maybe I need to shrink her down so that she fits just inside the lower canvas and have the dragon up larger on top. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing is I still have never been 100% happy with the hands in terms of the pose that the dragon was in. I'm trying to figure out what kind of business I wanted him doing with the hands. When I say business, I mean if the dragon's going to be in a particular pose, I want that pose to be compelling and part of the storytelling. And right now, yes, he's perched here, but it's, it's okay to have him perched just because a pose is cool. But ideally, you want him doing something with his hands that works with the story of this whole thing and right now i've got this other claw up only because it fits the composition but it doesn't also tie into the storytelling so i decided well let me go back and at least re-examine some of these ideas and i went through and did another sheet of sketches and in this one i started first off by just figuring out what do i want the pose of the dragon to be and I started with just doing some sketches of wings and I pulled up some photo reference of bat wings. I looked up winged reptiles. I was looking at lizards. I was looking at lizards because I wanted to figure out what I wanted the front hands to be doing. But I also thought I want this large framing of the dragon's wings unfurled to be the main thing. Like you've got this large, massive, majestic presence filling up most of the canvas. So a lot of it was me just trying to figure out what kind of pose, what kind of, you know, how far I wanted the wings spread. Um, in the end, looking at some pictures of, I looked at some pictures of bearded dragons. Um, they're a type of, of lizard that a lot of people have as pets. And I was looking at those because I was thinking, well, it is a dragon, but also this painting is from my wife and she likes bearded dragons. She thinks they're very cute, even though we don't have any. If we were gonna get any reptiles, a bearded dragon would probably be the one we'd get. So I was kind of using that as a template. And in the end, I decided that the hands weren't really working. Like these poses weren't necessarily the pose that I had in my head. This was just me sort of experimenting and saying, well, let me try it like this. Let me try it like that. Let me see working out how the body is. I even found a sketch online. If I looked up 
lizard skeletons. Because if I'm trying to get the structure of this creature right, it helps to look at some anatomy and looking at sketches. I did a little sketch from a photo of a, a reptile skeleton, a lizard skeleton, to try and figure out, all right, if I'm gonna move the anatomy around, how can I sell this creature, the anatomy is being realistic for an unrealistic creature. Um, this pose up here is probably sort of in the ballpark. You know, I started with this saying, all right, well, what if I have her posed kind of below, you know, you're looking up at her a little bit. She's perched on a, a rock outcropping instead of being perched on the dragon. Then you've got the dragon sort of winding around her. And then I went to this sketch, which is very unfinished, but my idea was pushing her down even smaller and making the dragon even bigger. But then when I did this, this sketch, I realized, mm, I really need to work out what's going on with the wings if that's gonna be the framing device for this whole image. Figuring out the right proportion of how much wing to show was crucial in the sense that if the wings are taking up that much of the space, if I do do it so that the, the dragon is so large that the wings are going way off panel, then you're not getting a sense of the, the shape, the sil strong silhouette that the dragon makes. But if I make the dragon smaller so you can see too much of the dragon, you lose the majestic sense. So it was going back and forth, finding that balance, finding that shape was important. That's what led into these little sketches, you know, where I was looking at bat wings, a little thing of just sort of a serpent with wings on there, going through, you know, all these different doodles down here. And I mean, these are very scratchy, loose sketches of me just trying to figure out, I forgot about the, the female figure for a little while and just worked on trying to find a pose for the dragon that worked for me. I got down to this one and this one felt like it was pretty much in the ballpark of what I wanted. And that's when I said, all right, let me shift to working on silhouettes. Did another sheet of sketches. This one was pretty much where I was really closing in on what I wanted. You know, I started by saying, all right, how much dragon, how much is he gonna be blocking out? How much is gonna be the negative space around him? So really these two sketches were me really focusing on negative space, how much we're gonna see of him, how much of the area around him. And that's when I keyed in on having the, the figure meditating before him you know, fitting into this space, a little piece of rock coming up between the coils of the dragon. You know, the dragon's tail goes down, out into the the background, but then comes back around, you know, the tail circles around into the foreground coming around. So I was trying to go for something dynamic, you know, in that sense. And it even, you know, well, I'll get into the next part, but actually, you no, know, I'll go ahead and say it here. Um, I moved on to these other sketches and went for something that was a little bit more finalized and even a little color sketch. But when I got down here with that same layout, I thought, this form is not quite dynamic enough. Can I have these the tail swing into an arc that sort of titers, almost like a roller coaster, like it's coming down from the body and swish down, and then down behind, then back up and over around into the foreground. So that was one of the notes that I had for myself moving into my final layout sketch. You know, a few more sketches in here saying, all right, well, let me work out the dragon head. And I moved away from the more sculptural, blocky head that I had before. And these sketches, this one in particular was done from a bearded dragon and I just sort of added horns and sharper teeth. But then going through here, I was trying to find some of those middle ground between a bearded dragon and a moray eel. You know, kind of working out these the facial structure here. Then uh, there's also the light source because I try, or I've been trying in recent months, in recent years to be very cognizant of my lighting. Cause I've realized that choosing my light sources poorly and describing them poorly can destroy the composition. It can destroy the sense of form and figure. And lighting is not one of my strong suits. I'm not afraid of challenging things that, are, that I'm weak at because Going after and trying to do things you're not good at is how you become better at them. If you just say, well, I'm not good at it, so I'm gonna avoid that, then you're always gonna suck at it. Knowing that, I said, all right, well, I was originally gonna start with sort of a, an overhead light coming down, and I decided instead to make the light source for, for the scene the dragon's mouth itself. I'm gonna be cheating it a little bit because I don't think I'm gonna make the top, the top of the dragon's head as dark. I'm probably just gonna be let it have more of an environmental light. Like, it's gonna be mostly red, you know, 
yellows, oranges, and reds, really, really hot, warm colors, and then have the, the cool blues of the background work into the shadow sides of the dragon. But I go through all of those, doing these sketches down into here, and then trying to say, all right, well, first I wanted to work out my tonal values. And I didn't go full into full-on shading, you know, dark lights and midtones, but really just saying, here's my, my shadows and my blacks, here's my lights, the gray tones I'll work in in terms of, uh, of color. I'll let color do the, the midtones. And when I went in to do this color study based on that lighting, I really, there's a little bit of, I used a little bit of black colored pencil down in the, the foreground and a little bit um, separating the mountains in the background from the sky. But for the most part, I tried to do all of this in color because one of the things I'm trying to pay attention to in painting is that, you know, usually the use of black and white is very limited. I'm sure that anybody who's studied painting or color theory has heard this a million times, is that, you know, mostly more often than not, you, you know, you have to be very judicious about black and white because they draw attention. They're very bold statements. You wanna to wanna to use them on the things that you really wanna draw attention to. For the most part, you get a much more naturalistic feel if you do a lot of work with color. And I thought, okay, let me try to work this into my piece because it's, again, it's not one of my strong suits but the only way I'm gonna get better is by trying to do more color work. And I mean, that's part of the thing that me doing a traditional painting. Um, as I'm telling you all these thoughts, these are all of the corrections. The point of this whole thing is that I had a sketch that I was happy with. I was gonna start this as the painting, but I went back and I looked at the problems I found with it and one by one, I tried to address those problems. That's what you want to do. You don't want to just beat yourself up and say your work sucks. You want to pick a thing that isn't working and say, all right, well, how do I fix this? Your answer is, I don't know. If I knew how to fix it, I'd be a better artist and this thing wouldn't suck. Set those thoughts aside. They're negative and they don't help you. Try something different. Just try, all right, let me try putting the camera at a different angle so the perspective is up. Let me try the angle looking down. Let me change the proportion between the different characters. Let me do some research on lighting. Let me Google lighting, dramatic lighting for illustration. Um, look up photo reference. Look at different things. Um, do research for composition or fantasy composition. Look at other work from art other artists and try to find answers to solving the problem. I mean, you obviously want to look at it and come up with ideas of your own, but you can look at things from classical art, from what things other illustrators have done and say, well, how can I adapt this to my own work? The point is to try and be productive and look at, try to create or find solutions to the problems you're having. So by the time I got to this one, I was like, okay, now I actually am happy with this illustration. And then I went on to the phase that I usually do for my comic books. Um, oh, as a side note, something else I was gonna mention, the challenge of me doing this color sketch is that I do a lot of comic book work and most of my comic stuff is all black and white. I've started adding gray tones to uh, my pieces in Photoshop and my comic book pages, but generally I do black and white. I really only do color covers and I do color on the art prints that I do. So doing a sketch in color, a small thumbnail at this stage really helps me work out more problems before I get to my final piece. And here, a lot of the frustrations you may have in doing your art is that you sit down with a blank sheet of large Bristol board or a canvas and say, all right, I'm gonna make a painting. And as you start going into it, you're finding all of these little problems that keep cropping up and all these little problems become overwhelming. You're like, this just sucks and I don't know how to fix it. If you start trying to fix these things, pages and pages of sketches. I mean, really, so I've got what, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five sketches here, and this is before I even get to my layout. Um, and that's also not including the Photoshop color sketch I did of this one. Um, that's still not that many sketches. Sometimes if I'm working on a piece, I may do, depending on how complicated it is, I may do twice as many sketches as this. And what you're doing is you're working out all of those tiny problems that would normally, if I went straight from my first idea my first thumbnail, if I went straight from this to trying to do the painting, of course the painting's gonna suck because I didn't try to work out all these kinds of different problems that 
do exist. Because right now, the perfect picture is only in my head. It doesn't exist on paper yet. And as I try to put it out on paper, unless I go through this process of working on all these little things that are wrong, those things are just gonna be there in the final piece. And it's much harder to try and fix them in a big canvas thing than it is to sit here and spend five or 10 minutes and just do more sketches. And here's the other thing. I like doing thumbnails. It's weird, like when I write, I like doing outlines. I'm a huge outliner. I love doing that with my comic stuff. I like that a lot more than writing the final thing. The whole process of fi fixing these things out, exper experimenting with different compositions, I enjoy that. So try to take pleasure in it and just treat it almost the same way you treat a sketchbook. Just sit and you're doodling ideas and moving pieces around. That's all this is. And I find it very gratifying. And I think if you try and take your artwork to that approach, you'll find your final pieces will be more enjoyable and they'll come out better too. If you enjoy doing the process to develop them and work out the flaws, you know. So this is the layout sketch that I did based on uh, on this color sketch. So this thumbnail here, you can see a little bit of the uh, the light coming through um, you know, on the drawing table because I drew it on vellum. This is again, I've mentioned it in some of my other drawing videos, the reason why I use red pencil. I'll go through, I'll do this, this rough sketch and basically work out my ideas. Then I come back in, I flip it over, and I draw a pencil on top of it. The idea is simply that drawing on red on one side means that when I draw the graphite on top, I can see the difference between the lines that I started with my rough sketches and the corrections that I made. Now, in this one, even this drawing, I still had a lot of work to do. The whole point of doing corrections like this is to say, all right, well, what did I think was working that's not working? And this drawing, I spent so much time killing tangents. There were so many places here where one piece was flowing into another in a way so that the tail was merging with the figure in the wrong place and they kind of blended together. Or, you know, the, this rocking, this rock outcropping down here. It's like I've got three different levels of, of rock cropping, really four different levels. Like I've got the rock that she's sitting on top of, then I've got this piece of rock here, which it almost seems like two, but I really kind of see it, this is one piece, then another piece. And then there's just sort of mid-ground rock that's right before you get to the dragon. And this mid-ground piece here, I redrew this probably three or four times, trying to figure out how I wanted it to be there. And I looked up some reference of rocks and even this, still I'm not 100% happy with, but I feel like I've pushed it to the point where it works for the painting. But there's still, even in this, I went through and there's all these places where after I scanned this drawing in, I still went back in and said, all right, the tangent, I tried to place it so that the, the arm of the wing was going in between the fork of the tongue, so it wasn't really hitting a tangent. And when I looked at it in Photoshop, I'm like, no, nah, it still just reads like a tangent. It doesn't look good. So I ended up... Um, painting out some part of the wing so it's almost like there's more of a glow of light around here and you can see the the wing fading out from underneath that um, down here I realized that as the dragon's body arcs down the way that this particular spike is standing up makes it feel like the the dragon's body would be coming more and you'd see more of it on this side of it which was there in one of the original sketches and i thought mm, it confuses it a little bit it's better to have it end completely behind her so that her face is just framed by the negative space having another shape in there confuses it so this mind you like this is me again looking at things that aren't working and saying well how can i fix that this particular spike is too high and I've already scanned the drawing in so I'm gonna go in in Photoshop and I'm gonna draw it a little bit lower to make you give you more of the sense psychologically that this tail once it goes bent her head is dropping really hard like almost as if this little line that's here symbolizes the arc of it going down so you'll think more that it's just sort of curling back down and going you know into the the background and connecting to this part of the dragon's body. There's a couple of other things that I'm going through and I'm fixing in Photoshop. Now, mind you, that's after doing all those sketches and still doing this rough layout 
and then still coming in here and picking out little things that aren't working. There's always gonna be things you're gonna find in your work that you're not happy with, doesn't look good, or it's not convincing, or it's distracting, it sticks out in the wrong way, and you just keep chipping away at them. And, and this is my point, is don't get mad at yourself. It doesn't help anybody, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help anyone that looks at your art. It's defense mechanism. Sometimes by saying our, our artwork sucks before someone else does, it protects us from the criticism because it's like, well, you can't tell me I suck. I'm already saying I suck. It, no one wants to see you beat up on yourself. Just look at it, analyze it, and fix the things that you can fix. And that's one of the places where getting critiques from other people can help. If you've literally fixed every single thing you can think of, then it's worthwhile to go to other artists that you know, or if you have an art instructor showing them your work and saying, um, all right, what's wrong with this? But I think a lot of times the big problem is that you don't do the work yourself first. Don't go to other people and ask for answers if you have not sat down and really tried to fix every problem on your own. Because that's not fair to the other people because you're expecting them to do the hard work that you need to do. And in the end, you can't do that with every piece. At a certain point, you need to do the process that I just showed you, which is to sit down on your own and go through your own work piece by piece and you're not tearing it apart to beat yourself up. You're analyzing it and you're fixing it. It's like an auto mechanic going and hooking up a car um, to a computer and running a diagnostic on the, the car and then lifting the hood, checking all the pieces, seeing what's corroded, what needs to be changed out. It is a process to go through your, your artwork methodically and try to figure out what's wrong and how to fix it. That's it for now. Check out my website, OpticHouse.com. If you enjoy these videos, please share them. Also, sign up for my weekly newsletter to get a free digital download and see what else I'm working on. Go be creative.